I turned 40 this year. I I'm an old man now. Older and wiser. Wiser than you. Today I'm going to show you the best games from every year that I've been alive, according to me. Roll the intro. Hello, hi there, I'm TechTweeb, welcome, thanks for clicking on the video today. So, 40 years, my favorite game from each year. There's a lot of games to cover, uh, no time to goof around. So let's dive right in, shall we? The year I was bored, 1982, uh, I didn't game much. I spent most of my time crying like a little baby. But there was a game released this year that I've played a ton. Asteroids. It's one of my favorite classic arcade games. It's a simple game. You just fly your little spaceship around the screen, shooting the asteroids. The physics are, are great. You, your ship has actual momentum, and you use your thruster to adjust your trajectory. It's uh, very satisfying. <laughs> In 1983, I was one years old, not playing games yet, obviously. But one game came out this year that I got later, one of my favorite Atari games, River Raid. It's a really good game. I don't hear many people talking about it. It's simple. It's a, it's a vertical scrolling shooting game. You're flying a jet along a river, shooting boats and helicopters. In 1984, I was only two, but there was one game that came out this year that I loved later on in life. King's Quest. It's the classic adventure game formula where you walk around the game world exploring, solving puzzles, and you interact with the world by typing simple commands and hoping that something happens. The, the King's Quest series is well loved f for good reason, and it all started with this game. In 1985, I was three years old. And a game came out this year that I wouldn't get my hands on for a few years because I didn't have a Nintendo, but it rocked the game world to the core. And it was an obsession for me. It's Super Mario Brothers on the, on the NES. I think the one thing that really sets this game apart, uh, the, the thing that was a big step forward, in, in my opinion, was the physics. Uh, Mario felt like he had weight to him. He, he almost had like analog control over his momentum. And he's just a lovable character too, that Mario guy. <laughs> what a cutie. In 1986, I still didn't have a Nintendo, but I had friends who had theirs around this time. One game came out this year that I loved. It was one of my first Nintendo games, and to this day, it's among my favorite retro games. Rampage. This is the, a great game to play with a buddy, and the NES version was stress-free. You had infinite lives by default, so you could just play and play as long as you want. In the game, you're smashing your way across America, destroying every city along the way. 1987 was the year that I got my Nintendo, so obviously I played a ton of Mario, but I already told you about Mario. Uh, my game for 1987 isn't a console game, it's a computer game. It's called 3D Flight Simulator. This was one of the only games that we had on our first computer. It barely ran, but I freaking loved it, and I played it to death. It is what it claims, a 3D helicopter simulator, but it's actual 3D. This is probably the first actually 3D game that I ever played, now that I think about it. For 1988, there's no competition when it comes to my favorite game. Super Mario Bros. 3. I totally fell into the Nintendo marketing machine that swept the world at this time. Mario 3 was a freaking phenomenon. It was leaps and bounds ahead of anything else that we had at the time. The world was so huge. So many different types of lands to explore. So many secrets. The Koopalings were new to us here too. This is when Mario, as a character and a franchise, was taken to the next level. Pun intended. Uh, a game came out in 1989 that I wouldn't have the chance to play for a few years later on uh, my PC, but w when I got my hands on it, I fell instantly in love, and then, then I had it again on the Super Nintendo. It's SimCity. It's one of, if not the first, city management games. This game inspired an entire genre of games that's still going strong today. But of, of course, my favorite thing to do was play in free mode with all the money I want, build a huge city, and then unleash some disasters on it and destroy the place. That's the good stuff right there. When I was eight in 1990, a game came along that commanded attention. 
This was the release of the Super Nintendo. And the star of the show was Super Mario World. It's the quintessential Mario game. There's a reason that people play it to this day. It's the game that I played the most, not just in 1990, but probably for the next few years. It's such a huge game. So many levels, secrets. And while the graphics were good on a technical level, the art and character design is really what makes it a visual masterpiece that's stood the test of time. <laughs> you guys know that Burger Time Deluxe for the Game Boy had to be on the list. I didn't even know about it when I was a kid. I learned about it later in life and I fell in love with it. And it's my current favorite retro game. The, the game is very simple. You're just a, a little chef and you, you walk across the burger toppings and they fall down and squish the bad guys, which are sausages and tomatoes. You need to make all the burgers without being murdered by the toppings. Just like making burgers in real life. My best game from 1992 is Lemmings. I, I played this at my cousin's house on his computer and I loved it so much that I asked for it for Christmas for the SNES that year. It, it's a simple concept. These lemmings get dropped in the level and you have to save the suicidal little rodents from their own stupidity. You give them jobs, t turning them into little builders or diggers or climbers or whatever. And, and you, you need to get them to the end of the level. And each level has unique challenges. And the, the game gives you new abilities as you progress. <laughs> I still love this game. The, the Super Nintendo version is great to play on emulation. I think it was in 1993 that we got our uh, 386 PC, or maybe it was a 486, I forget. But what I do remember is that this had a color monitor, our first color monitor, and a 40 megabyte hard drive, and two megabytes of RAM. Then I got upgraded to four megabytes for my birthday. Doom was a, a few megabytes, and we didn't have room on our hard drive for much, so to play this, I had to uninstall Windows, install Doom, play Doom, and then when I was done, I had to reinstall Windows. And it was worth it, because this game was freaking awesome. I, I, th I only had the shareware version, I think, at the time, but that was plenty for me. This game was such a huge step forward for first-person shooter games, and it had a, a sound and style to it that was unlike anything that came before. If, like me, you had a Nintendo Power subscription back in the 90s, you probably remember this promotional VHS tape for Donkey Kong Country. What made this game innovative is that it's made with 3D graphics. The game itself is in 3D, but the textures and sprites, they, they, they were pre-rendered 3D. Back in 1994, the idea of true 3D was only just starting to become a real possibility. And Donkey Kong Country was a taste of what's to come. It was mind-blowing at the time, gra graphically, but the, the great gameplay and the tight mechanics are why this game is still great today. That and the lovable Donkey Kong himself, of course. Ready to work. In 1995, around this time, I finally got a real PC, and I used this PC to play a new game that was making the rounds, Warcraft 2. I had never played a real-time strategy game before this, but I fell instantly in love with the genre because of this game. Playing multiplayer over the modem was awesome, but the, the single player was where it really shied for me. Not only was the graphics and gameplay good, the story was good. There, there was a full campaign and in-game levels were part of the overarching story. I had never experienced anything like this before. I loved first-person shooters in 1996, like Wolfenstein and Doom, but when Duke Nukem 3D came along, it blew them all away. It was an evolution of the genre in so many ways. It featured a new engine called the Build Engine, which brought lots of improvement, like levels that morphed and changed with animation, like the world itself could move around. There were so many interesting weapons and enemies, and the game world was full of character and story and secrets. And the multiplayer was a freaking blast. I played this over my modem, and we do LAN parties just for this game. I still love playing this game too even after all these years. The original Tomb Raider on PS1 was special for me because it was one of the first truly 3D games that I played. Definitely the first one that actually looked good and was fun. And it was a female protagonist, which wasn't really a thing back then. You could explore ancient ruins, jump around like a pixelated monkey, and make Laura Croft do swan dives off cliffs for no apparent reason. And murdering wolves with guns, don't forget the murder. It's not the deepest game in the world, but the awesome 3D graphics and the solid action and the unique protagonist really set this one apart at the time. 
In 1998, uh, I used to babysit these kids and they had Half-Life on their computer. I would send them to bed early so that I could get a little bit of extra game time in. This is a game that is entirely 3D, entirely from a first-person perspective, and all the story happens from a first-person perspective too, which was a novel idea back then. You are Gordon Freeman, and you see through your own eyes the, the crazy experiment that causes the crossing of dimensions and the weird aliens and the monsters that come of it. It's a perfect mix of exploration, puzzle solving, and combat. I have a, a hard time thinking of a game that raised the bar quite like Half-Life did back then. Uh, the Half-Life engine was used to make a ton of games, but Team Fortress Classic was my favorite. In, in college, I used to go to an internet cafe to play this. They had gaming PCs set up and we played this for hours, day after day. I played it for years too. For this period of my life, I spent so much time in Two Fort that it was basically my home away from home. My class was the spy, by the way. One game that pulled me away from TFC on the PC for brief moments was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 on the PS1. This was like the ultimate hangout with your buddies game. Listening to the tunes, working your way through the game, doing all the challenges, unlocking all the levels, going for insane combos, finding a ton of secrets. That's what gaming's all about right there. Just pure progression, skill, and fun. A friend that I met at college got this new console that was just released, the Xbox, and he got Halo. And we played through that entire freaking game together, split screen co-op style. Oh, what a fun gaming experience. The game is great. It's pretty easy, all things considered, but it's easy to let yourself get in a bad way if you don't conserve your ammo and make smart decisions. The story and the graphics can be interested. They weren't like anything I'd experienced on a console up to that point. Yes, the sequel to my favorite real-time strategy game, Warcraft 2, was Warcraft 3. This was the first 3D real-time strategy game that I'd ever seen. And in typical Blizzard fashion, it was full of high-budget cutscenes and gorgeous graphics and tons of voice acting and a full story-driven campaign. One unique thing that was introduced in Warcraft 3 was the idea of asymmetric factions. Not just orcs versus humans, but also elves and undead in the mix. I love playing skirmishes in this one too, online, back on the old school battle.net, back in the, the good old days of online gaming. In 2003, I had a Game Boy Advance to keep me company on my super long commute to college. And I didn't have very many games, but the one game that I had that I loved was Advance Wars 2. This game defined the Game Boy Advance for me. It's a turn-based strategy game with a tight, bright, colorful art style and a really good story. The campaign in this game is really entertaining and varied and it stays interesting right through to the end. The gameplay is simple, there's only a handful of units, but it's as deep and strategic as a game of chess. By the way, nice to finally meet you. In my entire life, there has never been a game as impactful as Half-Life 2. Leading up to the release of Half-Life 2, I was freaking hyped, man. I didn't have a gaming PC, but my buddy, my freaking hero of a buddy, he had a gaming PC. And not only did he let me play Half-Life 2 on it, but he let me stay over at his place for many nights so that I could play through the entire game on his PC. Man, uh, what a freaking experience that was. Now, this game was such a huge step forward, not just for video games on, on a technical level, like the graphics and the engine, which it definitely was, but this was a, a giant leap forward for game design itself. I'll never forget uh, experiencing it for the first time. Like I said, I had a, a long commute, so having some games to spend time with was essential to me. At this time, I sold my Game Boy Advance to get my DS when that was launched, which was stupid. I wish I kept it, but the trade-off was worth it at the time. And a game came out that was a bit of an obsession for me for a while. Animal Crossing. Uh, my buddy Boris had it too. We used to dork out with this game. Two basically grown dudes scheduling playdates for our virtual citizens to visit each other's towns. <laughs> oh, what a bunch of dweebs. 
I didn't have an Xbox 360, but I visited my cousin and her boyfriend had a 360 and Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter. He was playing with his buddies on Xbox Live with his headset. I loved what I saw. PC gaming at this time wasn't nearly this convenient and streamlined. I picked up an Xbox 360 and Graw just so that I could play this with them. And I'm glad I did. It's a great game. It's a pretty typical third person shooter on the surface, but it's actually very tactical. You have to take things slow, plan out your maneuvers, work together. The sequel was great too. Assassin's Creed came out of nowhere. It, it wasn't on my radar at all. It hit like a ton of bricks. I fell in love with this game. At the time, it felt like a game from the future. The, the graphics and mechanics were so different than anything else that I played. It looked so freaking real. And the mechanics, the parkour was really what made this game special. I had never played anything like it. I still love the Assassin's Creed series to this day. Just before Wrath of the Lich King, I started playing World of Warcraft. It, man. I'm ashamed to say that I got super addicted. It's your typical story. I lived as my character in WoW, but in real life I, I gained weight, stopped leaving the house, let my friendships fall away, my health, lost out on work. It's a, it's a great game, World of Warcraft, and Wrath of the Lich King was so damn good. The frigid arctic setting and the, the culmination of the story of Arthas that started in Warcraft 3. It's a shame that I couldn't enjoy WoW in moderation, but that's just not my style. It's all or nothing with me, unfortunately. So I don't let myself play these games anymore. During 2009, I was still deep in the clutches of World of Warcraft, but one game came along that helped me enjoy other games a bit. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. I played the first one, Modern Warfare, but the sequel was the game that I got hooked in. The single player was great, but it was all about the multiplayer for me. The gameplay was just so freaking tight and satisfying. I played a ton on Xbox Live. Red Dead Redemption was another game that came out of nowhere. This game pushed the limits of the 360 hardware. It's, a, it's an amazing technical feat, really, that they managed to make an open world in a natural environment that looks this freaking good. The single player story was second to none, really. It, it was movie quality acting and animation. And the, the gameplay was like classic Grand Theft Auto gameplay, but with the slower, more gritty pace of a Western setting. The multiplayer made this one stick around for me though. Uh, we've all seen it a ton by now with games like Grand Theft Auto Online and Red Dead Online, but back in 2000, and Ted, this was a pretty new concept to have an online game that was as seamless as it was. In 2011, nobody missed Skyrim. This game was an unstoppable juggernaut. Everybody was stoked for Skyrim, and it didn't disappoint. It's not that much different than The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, in my opinion. It's an evolution rather than a revolution, but it's really the setting and the aesthetics that set this game apart. Skyrim itself is the star of the show. It's such a fun playground to explore and adventure. And great music too. I don't think I got Crusader Kings 2 right away when it came out in 2012. I got it later, but I d it did come out in 2012, and it's my most played Steam game, so it's gotta be on the list. I freaking love this game. It's like playing a game of medieval sims, but with more incest and murder. You could bury your cousin, plot to assassinate your neighbors, and declare holy wars for fun. You can do all the planning you want, only to have your favorite heir unexpectedly die from a mysterious illness, or be assassinated by your wife. Grand Theft Auto V came out this year and I loved that game, but I gotta go with Assassin's Creed Black Flag for my pick for 2013. It's my all-time favorite Assassin's Creed game. It's like half pirate simulator, half Assassin's Creed game, and I love both halves. You can pillage and plunder your way through the Caribbean while also saving the world from a secret society. I forbid myself from fast traveling. I sailed everywhere. I just loved being out on the water on my ship, singing sea shanties. And let's not forget the thrill and guilt of harpooning a whale to death. I was big into space games around this time in 2014, but when Elite Dangerous came along, it was like the space simulator that I'd been waiting for. 
It's a, like a space trucker simulator where you could deliver cargo and explore the galaxy, get, in, get into dogfights with space pirates. Just be prepared to spend hours navigating menus and tutorials. It's not a light pick up and play casual game. It's a haven't seen the sun or showered in days game, if you know what I mean. 2015 gave us The Witcher 3, one of my favorite games of all time. I, I played 1 and 2, but 3 was like the game I'd been waiting for all along. On the surface, it's a typical fantasy RPG that lets you explore a world full of monsters, magic, and moral dilemmas, but it's the story that makes this one special. Seriously, a single side quest in The Witcher 3 can be as deep and interesting and surprising as a different game's main quest line. If you haven't played this one, you really need to. It just got a next-gen update, and it's better than ever. So just dive in and get lost in the awesome gameplay, the rich lore, and forget about the real world for a while. <laughs> In 2016, a reboot of a loved series graced our computers. Of course, I'm talking about Doom. You guys know Doom. It's a, a game of demonic whack-a-mole where you take out your aggression on hordes of hellspawn. The fast-paced gameplay and the heavy metal soundtrack will make you feel like a total badass, even if you're just sitting on your couch in your pajamas. Now, this wasn't a great year for games that I was interested in, so I chose yet another Assassin's Creed game. Assassin's Creed Origins. You know, the Egypt one, where you get to climb pyramids while stabbing bad guys and tigers. This game moved beyond its simpler stealth roots and felt more RPG-ish. This is sort of like The Witcher meets Assassin's Creed. The, the world is big and beautiful with a surprising amount of historical accuracy. And the quests. Uh, so many freaking quests in this one. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'll save the world, but I just need to kill 10 crocodiles first. 2018 gave us another amazing game, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I liked all the reboot games, but this one is hands down my favorite. The story is actually great in this one. I was really into it. There, there's lots of side stuff to do as well, of course. Extra quests and challenges and stuff. The world itself is probably the main part of the game that I loved, other than Laura Croft, who's my girlfriend. The, the graphics are so realistic, you'll swear that you could feel the mud squelching between your toes as you slosh through the malaria-infested jungle. You'll feel like a, a total badass when you pull off a stealth takedown on a group of mercenaries and then accidentally fall off a cliff two minutes later. <laughs> to say that I was excited for Red Dead Redemption 2 is a bit of an understatement. This is probably the game that I've been the most excited for, other than Half-Life 2, of course. And it didn't disappoint, not at all. It, it, it actually exceeded my expectations in every way. The, the gameplay, the graphics, the multiplayer, all amazing, top notch, second to none. But it's the story that makes this one really special for me. More than once, this game brought a genuine tear to my dweeby eyes. I think it's the only game to do that. In 2020, some stuff happened. <laughs> I won't get into it, but it's just a bunch of stuff that really made you feel like the world was coming to an end. Lots of people looked for an escape at this time, and video games provide an escape like no other. Cyberjunk was my escape. I dove into this game. Yeah, there were bugs at launch, but I didn't care. I loved the world, the dystopian cyberpunk future. Few games have made me felt as immersed as this game. It's gotten way better over the years with patches and stuff too, so if you've been holding off checking this one out, now is the perfect time. In 2021, something monumentous happened. That's right, a little known nerd started a YouTube channel and Techweeb was bored. Uh, not literally, he was bored back in 1982. I already told you that, pay attention. And this little endeavor would change my life because for the first time, I wasn't buying tech toys and playing with them and goofing around with video game settings and all that stuff by myself. I was sharing it with you guys. And now it's become one of my favorite things in the world to, to play with tech and to share the stuff that I like and learn about and discover. 2021 wasn't an amazing year for games. There wasn't much that I liked that came out this year. But one game did come out that I played through to the end and enjoyed. It's Hitman 3. It's such a good game. It's stealth, it's action, but most importantly, it's puzzle solving. Figuring out how to get where you need to be when you need to be there to take down your target. 
so I'll go with Vampire Survivors. <laughs> this game was a micro obsession for me late last year. I played this on my RP3 Plus on vacation and ugh, it was so freaking addictive. You have no idea. And th there's not much to the game. You just move around and auto attack and you get power ups and see how long you can survive before getting inevitably overwhelmed by d demons or whatever. The funnest aspect of the game is the roguelike elements. Taking your earnings after a run and buying upgrades and new characters and levels and progressing in the metagame. And 2023 isn't over yet, so I'll hold off passing judgment on my favorite game for 2023. But uh, so far, 2023 is the year of indie games for me. There's a, there's a few that I'm loving playing on my iNeo Air and my Steam Deck, but I'll hold off telling you about those for now. So, what do you think of my list? It's a lot of work to figure out a, a list like this for you. But if you felt so inclined, I'd love to hear what your list is. Give your favorite games from every year you've been alive a, a shout out in the comments below. And while you're down there, click the thumbs up button if you like the video. Or don't if you did it. Th thanks for sticking through to the end. As always, I'm TechTweeb. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.